Hey folks, welcome back. It's Answer the Question with Rob and Chris. Boy, I'm going to have to do something. His seat, he looks like he's way up here. I'm going to have to stand up so that I <laughs> adjust my camera. Well, welcome back to the program, Rob. How are you doing today? Fantastically well, Chris. It's been a eventful, eventful week, eventful day. I will bet and for you at Dear SA. I bet you're knackered. Yeah. Well, let's let's Absolutely. let's let's get to that in a second. But I do just need to let people know about a breaking news story in New York, which I just covered in a short live broadcast. Uh, for those who missed this, uh, there is a situation in New York City in the borough of Brooklyn in which a gunman uh, implanted smoke bombs throughout the train. Initially, people thought there were incendiary or explosive devices that were concerned. There were bombs on the subway on the northbound train. At 8.30 this morning, he, he ignited one of the smoke bombs in one of the cars and began shooting at passengers on the train. People at the 26th and 36th streets, uh, 26th and 34th Street station poured out of the train and escaped um, the uh, the fire department. The police department responded. The bomb unit responded. Um, several people wounded. It reported initially five people were wounded uh, in the legs, it appears. Uh, doesn't, at this point, we've heard of no fatalities, thank goodness. Uh, but uh, that number has been revised upwards from five to 13 to 16 people as time has passed. We don't know the actual number here or what's going on. Uh, it does appear that it may likely be some sort of domestic terrorism event. Uh, this gentleman wore a, ye a yellow construction vest, had a gas mask with him, a firearm of some sort. No one knows what sort of firearm. Uh, and then had these smoke bombs planted throughout the train, obviously to cause chaos and confusion, which it did do. Uh, in the aftermath of the shooting, we see uh, photo evidence of people on the subway rendering first aid, uh, applying tourniquets, and treating people before first responders got there. It is heartwarming to see New Yorkers respond to such a crisis situation, and rather than flee when people need help to give aid and assistance to them. Uh, I don't know what's happening at this hour. We're waiting for a press conference from the city of New York, but at this hour, uh, schools are are sheltering in place in New York City, and we have a lot of chaos and uh, carnage going on in the Big Apple, folks. Well, that's the news from there. Uh, we don't want to dwell on that. Let's get to Rob and talk about this. Rob, you're probably knackered because, oh, I don't know, there's this, um, you know, let's uh, tell the government how we feel about their effort to make lockdown permanent situation here. Now, I'm getting all kinds of reports, Rob, so we're going to focus, uh, at least <laughs> to start, on this issue today because I'm getting uh, screenshots of people who've sent email and they use Outlook and, and, and you know, POP3 accounts that give you a message and endless screenshots of people who've sent email to the government deleted without having me read, deleted without having me read. Uh, now, these government officials aren't very bright. They don't realize that Outlook leaves this trail and you can use this as evidence in a trial. Uh, I'm just saying, so I just mentioned that. But we see that, uh, I, I, it's anecdotal. I don't I don't have the, the email, so I can't give you forensic evidence, but I've seen it in multiple social media places. They appear to be genuine screenshots. I know that, that people have contacted DRSA about this as well. And your website has been reported by people, true or not, to have crashed multiple times. Uh, I don't know how accurate that is. I do know you had some challenges ramping up last week. Where are we? And can you help us sort out any of these rumors? Yeah. Okay. First of all, the Dear South Africa website hasn't crashed at all. Now, it's there you go. Rumor, performing. rumor, rumor. Yeah. Rumors, rumors. They, they might be confusing uh, Dear SA website with a couple of other other websites. There's another one called uh, SA, SA Speaks or South Africa Speaks. Yes. Um, and or has to say or something like that. I don't know. They were also having problems with with the uh, with with their participation site, and, and they actually uh, uh, abandoned it and just started referring people through directly through to to government. And that's I think where where the trouble trouble started. Um, we did receive a, a quite a few uh, hundred notifications from from the public who have been sending emails directly through to to government and not not using not using our system and yes government has been deleting them uh, deleting the emails without even reading them so they just obviously email box is is overloaded they must have received uh, close on quarter of a million million emails from from the public because we also send emails to to that address at every time somebody pushes send on our system that immediately delivers an email directly through there so no doubt their system crashed. Government took it upon themselves to just go uh, control A, select and delete. And, <laughs> and that's exactly what's happened. But thankfully, we anticipate this. We've been uh, running public participation campaigns for sure, well over three years, approaching four years now. And we've, this isn't the first time that we've seen this, seen this happen. Our system keeps a record of every email that's delivered 
it's uh, it can uh, identify if government opens up the email if they click on a link inside there if they read it and if they delete it without opening so we've seen it a number of times and it's exactly why we record absolutely every single comment that comes in from every participant we keep a strong record of that we produce a report at the end of the day so not only do we deliver the emails individually or deliver the comments immediately we also produce that report at the end of the campaign and we provide government with hard evidence of the actual public participation and in this case there's no doubt we're going to have to uh, see government in court because we hold the evidence of the public participation that they deleted so well, I would hope Fun that times. I would hope that anyone that has an, an Outlook service or a similar service that has it's a POP three type of account, Post Office Protocol three, if they have that sort of account that gives you tracing for when someone's read your message or when they've deleted it, and the Outlook is well known for that, of course, but there's other methods to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. and hopefully, whoever has that information in a business or a private server, or whatever, please retain those things. Please save that yeah. deleted message, and you we need to keep this for forensic evidence for proving that the government had. Had no intention of ever listening to the public, just like the cigarette ban when the lockdown started. And Kozadani Dali Mizuma had no intention of listening to anything from the public. 100,000 plus responses complaining about ceasing cigarette sales from people who are addicted to nicotine and have serious issues with it. And about 2,000, a little over 2,000 people who said, oh, it's fine, you should ban cigarettes. She went with that. Talk about a, a ludicrous statement. So if I have 1 million people in South Africa who oppose the lockdown restrictions becoming permanent and one person is for it, does that mean we go for it? That's ridiculous. There's no consideration of the public. And to me, this is just a farce on their part. And that's why what you're doing at DRSA and what these other groups are doing and people hitting the government directly with messages is so important because this will not stand because in my view, having read South Africa's exceedingly long liberal constitution, uh, this is clearly, in my view, in clear violation of South African constitutional rights. At least that's my take on it. I'm not an attorney. I don't pretend to be an attorney. I don't play one on law and order. I'm just saying, as a layperson, mm -hmm. this couldn't possibly stand up to a legitimate test in the Supreme Court of Appeal or the Constitutional Court. My thoughts on that, Rob. And so that's why I think it's so important. I suspect you may feel similar, at least about keeping a record. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. In fact, we feel exactly the same way. The, the, first, the first step will be... Uh, to actually send a letter to, to government requesting further information on what actually happened. Was there a systems failure or was it human error or was it deliberate? And if they, they don't uh, respond to that, then we'll then request an extension on the comment period uh, for at least a, another month. Um, and then if they deny that, well, then we go off to court and we have a solid case and with, with absolute evidence that this actually did occur. You know, I have no doubt that this is all the case. I mean, this this is, I, I, gosh, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm, blah, 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 you know, I mean, I'm just <laughs> gobsmacked. I mean, the, the, the ANC doesn't even hide its criminal activity, its disregard, its blatant disregard for the welfare, the safety, the health and concern of citizens. They don't care. Yeah. They just yeah. don't care. I mean, here, let me give you three examples recently that just will blow people's minds. It'll beggar the imagination if you don't live in South Africa. First off, in Kanaland, which is a small municipality in the Western Cape, in which the DA can't take the lead, the EFF can't win, and the ANC can't win. So it's a coalition. There's only five seats on the council, so a very small council. A lot of these councils have many people, but five seats. There was a mayor who was elected and served under a local party, the Connelland Party, back in the early part of this century. While serving as mayor, he was arrested, charged, convicted of molesting and raping a minor. Repeatedly, multiple convictions of child molestation, pedophilic rape, while serving as mayor of Connellan. He had to resign. The judge gave him zero days in jail, gave him a fine, and we don't even know if he ever even paid the fine. Now, the young lady whose life was destroyed got no compensation. She gets no justice. Now, here's the thing. Fast forward to 2021. He's on the council because he ran again. He got on the council, you know, afterwards. He may have resigned as mayor, but he stayed there. He gets supported by the African National Congress for mayor, even though he's convicted child rapist. While sir, not only, I mean, it's one thing to be a convicted child rapist, but it's been connect, another thing to be in a position of authority responsible for citizens and then abuse that by being a child rapist. So the ANC supports him, he gets elected mayor, and it gets even better. 
I know you probably know the story, Rob, but many people don't know it. It gets even better. The deputy mayor, also from his party, is a convicted fraudster who has to wear an ankle bracelet and can't leave his home for two years. So, so these two reprobates are elected because of support from the ANC. Only after independent journalists like myself and even the mainstream media brought this to people's attention, the Daily Maverick and News 24, only after the uproar occurred did it get taken to the courts and they were removed. Now they're trying to fight in the courts. But this is what the ANC does. They support convicted child rapists and murderers. I mean, listen, Tony Yangani winds up back in parliament after being convicted of theft back in the 1990s. Winnie Mandela is convicted by the apartheid era government national party for kidnapping her role in, in the death of Stumpy, a 14 year old who was murdered by her acolytes. And they, well, that's just, that's just racism. They went after it. Okay, well, she was convicted of fraud by the majority government ANC as a member of parliament and came back to parliament. So Jeffrey Donson, convicted child rapist. Then we see in Pumalanga, this guy, Msibi, uh, who is was the Minister of Agriculture in Pumalanga, the provincial level. He was accused of murder, charged with murder, and attempted murder. And so he resigned as the Agriculture Minister. And then they just had the party conference in an absentia. He's elected overwhelmingly to be the Treasurer General, an accused murderer. <laughs> and it gets even better. Right. We just had the Itaquini that's uh, that's Durban municipality. Mm -hmm. The African National Congress just had their conference and accused, yet to be convicted because she still hasn't faced a trial after two years, accused former Durban mayor Zandile Gumeda, who is charged with dozens of charges of corruption, pervasive, massive corruption in Durban. She was forced to resign as mayor. Then last year, she was surreptitiously appointed to the provincial legislature by the party, because of course, you don't pick the, the candidates in South Africa, the party does. So they appointed her so that she had a job to make money. Well, independent journalists, and in this case, I'll give News 24 credit, they also screamed about it, raised the alarm, and the party had to back away. But she wasn't removed from the, par the, the provincial legislature. She's still there. She's just not working and getting a salary. She's been drawing a salary for over a year, a, an accused fraudster, and put in position of thought. This, this is the ANC. She just got elected in abstentia because she can't be at the conference to be the representative for the party in Durban. What kind of morons are these people? They're all gangsters. They're all, they don't represent 59 million South Africans. They represent 585,000 South Africans. Oh my goodness. Yeah, they do. There, there's no doubt about that. And it goes even further, Chris, if you look in... Uh, towards National Assembly, same yeah. thing happens there. Nothing ever happens. It's always accusations. And they always appear to be taking a, a, a st stance. So I'm going American. they taking a stance. Stance, against. taking their stance. There you go. Well <laughs> yeah. done, Rob. We'll get you taking converted. We'll get you converted. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 just say, say, say traffic signal. <laughs> Ro robot. Oh, no, robot. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they, they, they seem to be, they, they appear to be take, taking a, a stance against um, corruption and and fraud and, and so on. But nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. No one ever gets convicted. No one ever gets taken down. And I strongly suspect it's because everyone is guilty. <laughs> yeah, everyone, exactly. everyone is guilty. Everyone has skeletons in their closet. And there are some serious skeletons flying around in, in National Assembly. And at all leadership levels uh, everywhere within the ANC, so I think the the Jacob Zuma whole whole case has actually proven that that if um, he goes down, everyone goes down with him, and I, I can absolutely guarantee that that is uh, the, the situation throughout the ranks. It's it's quite quite incredible. But as you say, that is typical of a a mafia type organization. It is. It, it? It's a crime family. It, it's it's a racketeering mm -hmm. operation. There's there's no other description for it. I mean, it, it's just it's so pervasive. Every day you open up a South African news story, and you and you get mm -hmm. reminded of, of 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 corruption you forgot about. I mean, I forgot about Nelson Mandela's funeral. I remember, you know, of course, I could have been mm -hmm. hired to do South African sign language. <laughs> Oh, yes, Remember that? Yes. Oh my gosh! <laughs> fucking embarrassing. I mean, this is an iconic global figure, and they've got some clown making a hundred thousand dollars dollars, not rand, dollars a year wow. for sign language, and he's not even signing. He's just you know making stuff up. How insulting is that to South Africans <laughs> who use sign language to communicate? That's insane. Yeah. You know, but uh, yeah. so so but that's not the end. So that, that so I'd forgotten about the Nelson Mandela. Well, the Nelson Mandela funeral. There is people who apparently stole twelve million rand. The mayor yeah. of an Eastern Cape Town, the deputy mayor, several, they're all ANC members. One is, is a, is a uh, bureaucrat, so I, I don't know if they're an ANC member. But the rest of these people charged in this trial from 
2013, nine years ago. It's just now right. coming to trial. Nine years later, they got away with theft of 12 million rand for nine years. And they all, of course, were innocent. We didn't do anything. They all have pled not guilty. And of course, nothing will come of this. Nothing will come of it. Right. You've got you've got Ace right. Magashule with the with the asbestos contract in the free state. You've got Drs. Waylon Kesey, Dr. Digital Vibes himself. You know, ooh, Peebo Bryson, mm -hmm. do a little dance there, brother. Yeah, stealing money from people left and right. And by the way, people were all excited when when Waylon Kesey was removed as agriculture minister. Why? He's still in the parliament. He's still in the National Assembly. He still gets a paycheck. In fact, I watched him vote on the motion of no confidence against the cabinet. You know, he, he wasn't on camera. They, uh, 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 Honorable Kesey, you, uh, please turn your camera on. Uh, please remove your face covering so we can see it's you. I mean, this is just, this is a farce. It's an absolute farce. And yeah. what's so sad about this is that racists who oppose mm -hmm. majority rule made the argument that this is how South Africa be governed. And a lot of us said, you know, black South Africans, majority rule is perfectly fine. People can govern themselves. You know, they, now there's going to be a period in which there's going to be a shortfall of human capital because people haven't worked in government. They haven't worked in bureaucracies until you get those people experience. You're going to have some, you're going to have some road bumps. You're going to have some stumbles. But after three decades, that should all be worked out. People entering government now should be the second generation, third generation of young adults who grew up under majority rule and should be educated properly and should be able to walk in at entry level at the bureaucracy and accomplish things. But they're not. It's a total disaster. It's still a feeding frenzy. It's like the sharks digging up the chum in the water. This is a racketeering operation from the National Assembly to the local town councils. Yes, and it's going to get worse. There's no doubt that it's going to get worse. As, as the ANC has realized that they are losing uh, popularity, they're losing the vote, it's going to be an absolute feeding frenzy right up until the next elections. Um, I mean, who wouldn't? Who, who wouldn't do that? You've got away with it for 28 years. And you know that it, possibly in two years' time, you're going to lose your position. Why not like, absolutely go crazy? Especially because there's no, no consequence to, to your actions. And they well know that. Uh, they don't appear to be untouchable. They, they absolutely know they are untouchable. And that is, that is a sad state of affairs. But perhaps it's, it's because we ourselves, as, as voters, were too complacent right in the beginning. Yeah, I agree. We, I agree. We didn't get involved. We didn't keep an eye on it. We just accepted, hey, this is a great change. It's the whole world's watching us. Everybody else will be be making sure they do a good job and so on. And we sat, sat back and we let it happen. And we honestly, I, I think we have no one but ourselves to blame. If we had taken care of it right in the beginning and kept a close eye on it and formed solid uh, civil society organizations and watchdogs, perhaps it'd be a very, very different situation. No, I think it's a fair point. Not 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 to blame South Africans because I mean we'd say the same thing about what's happened in America too. But, but oh, yes. you know, I mean, but I have a defense, Rob. I was overseas most of the time when it all fell apart. <laughs> I mean, I was defending the yeah. Constitution and, and and helping people around the world for twenty three years overseas <laughs> when it all went to crap. I still voted, but I mean, I wasn't back here to affect you. I I couldn't. I didn't know that my kids were going to school and being taught that they're racist because they had pink complexion. You know, I didn't know that that sort of thing. <laughs> that all happened later, but but uh, or happened while I was overseas, but. No, but it's, I think it's a fair point, um, you know, and I tried so hard. Now, you know, I had a, a, a subscriber base of 23,000 before the old channel was taken away, but I, I put mm. so much energy and effort and I got zero compensation. I'm not looking for compensation. I got zero fame. I'm not looking for fame. I'm not looking for notoriety. I honestly wanted to exhort and encourage South Africans go to the polls and vote not for the ANC. Vote not for the ANC. And, and, and I wanted to see a turnout go over 40%. But what do we see? 31% turnout. You know, the, the yeah. in the municipal elections of 2021, you and I have talked about this before, the ANC still controls 128 municipalities. I don't know. They may have gotten a few more through coalitions since the election, but the end election, they controlled 128 municipalities outright. That's shocking. And they did so with 13% of the eligible voters voting for them. Yes. People are like, oh, they got 46%. They didn't get 46%. Arno Sefontaine just subscribed. Well, thank you for that. Sefontaine, one of my favorite rugby players. Whatever happened to him anyway? But um, not Arno, but another Sefontaine, Jan Sefontaine. But but 13, that people like you got 46. No, it's not 46%. It's 13% of the people in South Africa who are eligible to vote for political yeah. office voted for the ANC. That is a resounding rejection 
a resounding rejection. And any of the other parties, especially the major ones like the EFF and the DA crow about their performance, they can shut up too because their their performance <laughs> is even more abysmal. I mean, if you look at the 2016 yeah. to 2021, the NC lost 31 percent of their voters. They crater, especially in KZN. Ooh, KZN, yeah. and they just cratered. But the DA lost 37 percent of their voters, <laughs> and the EFF they lost did. the EFF lost two percent. They lost two percent. Yes. Yep. That's and it. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy stuff. It's, it's it, it goes the the it goes so deep, Chris. Really, I, I was actually chatting to a, a a counselor from one of the major metros today, and uh, what goes on behind the scenes and in in council meetings that we don't know because the cameras have been turned off, is is quite shocking. If if we think that one party is better than another and the ANC is the only ones that are that are corrupt, we're sadly mistaken. They. Yeah. Pretty much, pretty much all. Well, I wouldn't say all. Majority of them, of them are. Even those ones that you think are, 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 are heroes and and um, <laughs> I, I keep wanting to slip out to who it who it actually is. I have to bite my tongue here. But yeah, there's there's. If you think that there's um, that a party is corruption free, I think again. They once they're exposed to to that kind of money and uh, privilege purely without lack of oversight, yeah, but it is actual privilege. They they feel privileged, and they can uh, spend as as much money as they want. The, the council actually told me that um, the they were to install an average speed hump, you know, a, a, a traffic speed calming bump, speed speed bump, yeah. speed bump, yeah. They they used to be I was American about, English, American English speed bump, speed bump, okay, not a speed hump. Bump. A hump is what's on a whale. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> speed bump. <laughs> yeah, so a, a speed bump would, would cost upwards of of a, a million rand to install, install a, a speed million bump. rand. I could do it for a thousand bucks. Exactly, <laughs> and pay exactly. my and pay my crew and make a profit. Yeah, and they they've got that that down now because they've been uh, doing proper auditing and investigation and so on. But the point is that all of that stuff went unchecked before previously. So. Yeah. How much money has been wasted, and especially at, at municipal levels? And well, I think it was a million rand. He said, "If if, if he's listening, give yeah. us give us the actual figures." But <laughs> but traffic circles as well. You could pay like four million rand for it for a traffic circle, and really, it's unbelievable. Or and a, a, got mi- a million down to rand, fifteen thousand. A million rand for a soccer stadium in the Eastern Cape. Yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. A stadium exactly. with two rows of aluminum bleachers that seat 100 people. <laughs> That's not a stadium. Um, exactly. you know, so here's the thing. This is what's bothered me all along. Now, when I was in uniform in the government, in the intelligence community, I pointed this out to people in the U.S. Um, leadership roles. And I said, all you have to do in South Africa is look at what we look for in the intelligence corps. I was a counterintelligence agent responsible for making sure people are trustworthy and investigating espionage and, and spying against our country and so on and counterterrorism. And I said, the thing that always is the most obvious thing when people are up to mischief is a very simple phrase. And it's very easy to follow Mm. up on. Undue affluence. Undue affluence. If your salary is a million rand a year, but you have a Lamborghini and you have, you know, Piaget watches and you're wearing $5,000 suits, nobody can buy those things on a million rand a year. Now, for a lot of South Africans, a million sounds like a lot of money, but it's not. It's not even $100,000, you know, so it's not a lot of money. But... Mm-hmm. On that salary, you should not be able to buy those things. Now, just because someone has nice things doesn't mean that they're stealing. They could have had an inheritance from a, from a parent or yeah. grand. So, I mean, that's possible. They might have a business, a legitimate business on the side that generates revenue for them, or maybe they made legitimate investments. But the fact that I see Julius Malame arriving around in Range Rovers when he's never held a job in his life and wearing Piaget watches and flying and jetting all over the place already raises red alarm flags to me to go, let's look at his source of income and look at his expenditures, which are publicly available. It doesn't even take warrants to do this. And we quickly see a picture of a criminal, a thief, someone who clearly is living well beyond his means. Where is the money coming from? Is it being funneled by a capital interest? Is it being stolen from the VBS bank? It's not hard. And look at the ANC. So many of them live these ostentatious lives. They're little snot-nosed children ride around in these ridiculous cars and stand there like there's something mm-hmm. special because look at me, mm-hmm. I'm 19 
19 years old and look at the size of my bum and this this Ferrari next to me. You shouldn't have a Ferrari at that, at that age. And I don't care how big your bum is. It shouldn't fit in that car. You know, the, the undue affluence is the key. It doesn't take much to do forensic to expose these frauds. It's so easy to do. Yet people just look the other way. The whole time that these clowns and their offspring and like Mugabe's kids are sporting, doing all this stuff, drinking, you know, champagne and, and mm. stuff in hotel mm. rooms, paying... 10,000 rand a night for hotel room. The whole time this is going on, the public is just looking at the social media going, ooh, cool, like, you know, retweet, excuse me? How about attention, <laughs> focus, undue affluence, criminal activity, expose, expose, charge, convict, prison time. Case closed. <laughs> totally agree. And it, they, they may have our president standing up uh, about, I think it was around about three years ago, and he was saying, no, we need to do, we're going to do lifestyle audits on all members of parliament and all members of ANC, and this will reveal everything. Yeah. Where are no, those no audits? Talk, no action. Well, well exactly. yeah. Ramaphosa came into office as president after being deputy president for a number of years. By the way, but folks, if you hear tapping in the background, that's Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> that's Rob's dog, Francesca, who we've yet to see on camera yet. It's not going to be a Carter-like moment here from Ronaldo. But, but Ramaphosa came <laughs> in office in February of 2018, 2019. 2020, 2021, 20, four years plus he's been in office. Where are these lifestyle audits? And oh, by the way, he's just now asking for a self a self um, assessment from his members of cabinet. <laughs> Can't you assess their performance? I can tell you what, call me up. I'll be happy to give you a report card on every one of them. NDZ, uh, Becca Chile, uh, Ronnie LaMola, the whole list of these reprobates. I can give you a performance appraisal right now. Almost none of them can climb above a C. You know, virtually all of them have an F. <laughs> Total failures. Absolutely. And, we're, and we're not talking Absolutely. we're not talking about a South African matrix F where you get thirty percent in two subjects, you go to university. No, no. We're talking about real Fs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and it's, I, 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 you kind of wonder what what's happening with the upper management in in government, because if you if you can't tell that your middle management is not performing, then you're really not a good manager, are you, or, or a good well, director? Or certainly not. Certainly not a good leader. That's for darn sure. That's that's pretty Absolutely. evident. I mean, Ramaphosa. Ramaphosa is an is a a. a, 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 a I keep mixing Biden and Obama. You know, I, o, o, o Biden is what I want to say. <laughs> but uh, he's an Obama-like leader. You know, he leads from behind. Mm -hmm. He lets other people step out there and do it. I mean, the invasion or the, the attacks against Gaddafi and his forces in Libya. The United States led from behind. Behind the British and French, we flew in fuel for them and let them lead the attack. What kind of lead? That's not leadership. Either you lead or you don't lead. Either you take action or don't take action. But don't you hide behind the, the apron of someone else. But um, it is answer the question, and we do have a question here. So let me get to that one uh, before I get too far away from it. So John asked uh, a few minutes ago, um, he asked, uh, please confirm if Rob, with Rob if action is being taken regarding the labor laws and mandatory jabs in the private sector. Is anything being done about that? Do you guys have a campaign about that as well? We certainly do. Absolutely. I knew, I knew the answer, to that. I knew the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. We've actually uh, written a legal letter to to the minister and to uh, several other ministers, and we've requested uh, harsh information and um, a full withdrawal of that uh, code of practice, it's called. The code of practice which mandates uh, businesses and business owners to uh, force force uh, injections on on people i'm not going to call them vaccines because yeah, as we've jabs. seen so say jabs so we don't want to get shut down jabs. by youtube <laughs> yes to force jabs on there so we've we've given we've set a deadline on that if we don't hear back from from the minister or, or the ministry or the department then we will be pursuing that in in a court of law and we've reserved that right to to do that it's part of our part of our campaign on the uh, health amendment act and or oh, sorry that the amendments to the to the health act and regulations and what the government is trying to do here is sneak all of these um, permanent regulations under, under different legislation and uh, force businesses in the private sector to do the dirty work for for government they're trying to make amendment. they're trying to make the private sector agents of the state 100% correct, 100% correct, because they know full well that there will be court cases left, right and center from absolutely every organization, individuals and and so on, should they introduce mandatory vaccinations from at a policy level uh, through, through, through government themselves. So they're using existing legislation to force the private sector's hand in, in getting that getting that across. But we're on top of it. We're absolutely on top of it. It's, it's that that regulation is 
uh, totally unjustified. You cannot use the labor law to enforce or manage a pandemic. So it absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. So should they go ahead? Should, you not, should they not respond to, to our letter of demand? We will see them in court. Well, John Jarvis, there's answer your question directly. And you can go find um, on the campaign page here, go to dearsa.org, and you can look up all the campaigns, including the current one now, which has 228,000 responses. That's about 760 some thousand less than I'd like to see. But anyway, folks, yeah. get busy. You got four <laughs> days left. Get busy. You got four days left. But, um, you know, so so the, the, the good news, uh, Rob, if you look at it this way, is there's, there's a precedent for exactly the action you're taking and to stop the exact same sort of action. And it's like looking in the mirror. Come here to the United States where the Biden regime sought to fraudulently violate the Constitution by going around the Constitution with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is the people responsible to make sure that children aren't working in factories, that you aren't just burning toxic chemicals and dumping them, that you have, you know, safe equipment so people aren't being amputated, you know, cutting you know, uh, meat and things like that and working in factories. They're about safety in the workplace. That exists. And there's laws to allow that to exist. So they fraudulently tried to go around the Constitution because they don't have the authority to dictate that people get jabs in the Constitution. So they want to use this organization and they issued a, a regulation saying that every private employer with 100 or more employees in the country, which covers 90 to 100 million workers in this country, about two thirds of our, we're about, about 55% of our workers in the country, that they would have to be jabbed by a certain date. Now, that's illegal, but the Biden regime knew it was illegal. They didn't care. They went ahead and implemented it. And they frightened tens of millions of people who probably wouldn't have gotten the jab under moral, religious, or just, you know, no interest um, in getting the jab into getting it so they didn't lose their livelihoods. And wow. the fact that the jabs are protected from, you know, harm that they may or may not do to people uh, because they have blanket immunity makes that reprehensible morally, in my view. It's also illegal. So what happened is this, it went to the Supreme Court and it's been struck down. It's been struck down. They can't do it. Every effort that the federal government has made with the exception of one, which was just overturned, to try to force people to get the jabs has been turned away. Now, the federal government tried to make federal employees get the jab. They put it in place. They, and most federal employees rushed out and got the jab so they wouldn't lose their cushy, you know, well-paying and good benefit jobs, even though they didn't want it necessarily. Well, that was stopped by a federal judge. And now an appeals court has overturned that, but not on the basis it was illegitimate on, on, on a procedural reason. So uh, that, that's likely to be struck down if people take it up to go to the Supreme Court. So every time they do it. So you have, you have, a, a precedent here in the United States where the government tried to use labor law to force people to get the jab. And and, and the, the reasoning isn't even, it's nonsensical. So I, I think, you know, I don't know what your lawyers look at, but they might take, and I don't know how much precedent abroad plays in a court case in South Africa, maybe not much, but it can be used as an example. I mean, listen, the ANC's talking about, we've looked abroad, we've looked at other, they're always telling the public how they've looked at what other people do. Um, and well, then let the courts look at what other people do. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, case and a good case study to actually present because that's exactly, exactly what they are doing here. And they're also using uh, the OHS uh, statutes and, and laws to to enforce that, creating a safe work environment. And then uh, the health inspector has, now has a new role and, and so on to, to enforce COVID regulations. But that's really, it's, it's not what the occupational health and safety uh, regulations and legislation stands for. Exactly. It's not that at all. It's for workplace safety. Workplace safety. Yes. And this, this is a stretch. This is, a, it's just, just like in the, in the new regulations proposed, which Ramaphosa didn't bother to share when he told people online in his press conference. But the regulation was included, if I arrive at OR Tambo and I don't even have to exhibit symptoms of any illness and a Durco... Um, with a grudge, Durko being the Director of International Relations and Cooperation, that's the foreign ministry in South Africa, for those who aren't familiar with it, but they call it a department. South Africa confuses everybody. They have ministers in charge of departments. <laughs> departments is an American thing. We have secretaries in charge of departments. They, they claim they have a president, but he's actually a, a, a parliamentary president. He's not an actual president, it, it, but he has presidential powers. Like it's, even, it's very confusing. South Africa's system is South African, very sure. But but I could arrive in OR Tambo and the official who's got a grudge or something like that, or might don't like me from a previous visit, he can go, so, Mr. White, uh, we're going to take you over here. You have to be isolated for two weeks at your expense. Uh, we're concerned that you've been infected with a pathogen. What pathogen? Well, we're going to test you for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So you see what, and that's how the law is written or the rule is written. They could do that for HIV. Now, we've spent decades trying to overcome stigma and decriminalize being HIV positive, And they could use that as an excuse. 
any pathogen. Now they're saying airborne, but uh, HIV is not airborne. But you get my point. Um, it could be tuberculosis. It could be it could be influenza, bird flu. Take your pick. It's this is insane. Exactly. It's absolutely insane, and it's a total abuse of power. Yes, and it's it, it's it, as you said that it's on on suspicion exactly. rather than no evidence rather than actual. I don't even have, I don't even no have to evidence. sneeze or cough. Exactly. So I just, is, I just is, have to is be, suspicion a crime? I just have to be pink. <laughs> Is that to be pink? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get locked up immediately. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> well, listen, I'll tell you, every time I've gone to Heathrow the past decade or so, when I land at Heathrow, that's why I'm, in the future, I'm probably going to fly somewhere else like Manchester or, or Cardiff because every time I go to Heathrow, now I'm, people don't infer incorrectly, this is a statement of fact. Every single time I come through, now there's no beard, short hair because I was still serving the military, properly dressed, um, sometimes a diplomatic passport, sometimes a tourist passport, depending on the circumstances. Every single time I go through, I get through immigration, not a problem. And then the customs guys, they're all South Asian Brits. I assume they're citizens, otherwise you couldn't serve in the, in the, in the, in the service, but they're, they're all South Asian. I get pulled aside. Dodgy looking people from all over the world go right by me with bags, stuff pouring out of the side of it, string tying their bags together. <laughs> I've got a single little carry or you know, carry on I'm dragging along or no carry on and just a, and, and, and a shoulder bag. Uh, sir, come here. Uh, yes. Um, what do you bring in the country? Uh, nothing. Uh, what's in your bag? Well, why? Well, we'd like to see it. Well, I'm, here's my passport. I'm a diplomat. You're not entitled to see it. Is there a reason you'd like to see it? I mean, I'll be happy to cooperate if you give me a legitimate reason. Uh, now, I never say this, but did you just stop me because uh, my ancestors left here four centuries ago and your, your ancestors came here two decades ago? I never say that, but anyway. <laughs> but I mean, it's every time, Rob. I get, I, now, I will say that Durko officials, I've never had any real problems. How I know a lot of people had trouble with Durko, so I don't mean to pick on them, but you know, but I mean, they're given a lot of power. I mean, like they have the ability to put somebody as an undesirable immigrant by putting them into the database and it's almost impossible to get taken out of there and then you're banned from South Africa for five years. I've seen this happen repeatedly, people from neighboring countries, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho especially, um, a Durko official has been out of shape or, or they misread a date on something and then it goes in there and once it's in there, it's in there, even if it's wrong. And it takes an act of God to get somebody out of that database. And that's 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 a shortcoming in South Africa, they need to fix it. Exactly. And, and there's another problem they had too with immigration a few years ago, they started demanding genuine original birth certificates if you brought a child with you. That's insane. Yeah. That's insane. Who carries your child's birth certificate? I mean, especially given the amount of time people get robbed or things happen, you don't take your child's birth certificate. That's ridiculous. The argument was it was supposed to stop child um, child trafficking. Well, listen, having worked in law enforcement, child trafficking is pretty easy to pick up on. Now, now, if you if you don't require birth certificates, you may miss the occasional circumstance of a disgruntled spouse taking their child from another country and bringing them back to South Africa. You may miss that because it's a loving parent with their child. But if people are being trafficked, unless you're an idiot in law enforcement, it's pretty easy to pick up at a port of entry. Most people being trafficked aren't flying into OR Tambo. Most of them are coming across the Bight Bridge border, dodging crocodiles or coming in on boats from China. I'm just saying. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think you're absolutely correct there. You know, you have to wonder if it's if it's not a, a deliberate move. Are they are they planning on? Well, I suppose it's it's giving them the freedom to actually detain anyone at at will at under, any time. Under, at any time, and that's great when you when you're a failing or uh, about to lose political political party. Why not detain your your detractors and your your opposition and um, that perhaps is, is a wake-up call for, for South Africans. Oh, they'd never do that. Well, yes, they would. Of course oh, they would. Well, well, I mean, look, Rob, I mean, I, I need to write an article on this, and this is something I need to think about maybe this weekend or maybe I'll get to it sooner. But, I mean, there's a pattern here. Expropriate, thank you, Lori. Lori Letson just gave it from Finland, just gave a five euro um, super chat. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, Lori. This is Rebellious Ruth's April sub. Oh, because, yeah, Rebellious Ruth, uh, her, her cards were compromised, and so she lost her subscribe. She used to be a, a member here. Uh, Ruth, um, if you try to go in, if you've got a new card and try to subscribe again, you might still get your longevity. I can't promise that because I have no control over it. But why don't you do it, Ruth? Um, that's kind of hint, hint. Become a member again, Ruth. Hint, hint. Uh, no. <laughs> but uh, but Lori's just covered her fee for April. Thank you for that, uh, Lori. I appreciate that. But um, here's the thing. There's a pattern here. As I've told people endlessly, and it's so hard to get South Africans to listen to this, expropriation without compensation is not about farmland. Yes, farmland is part, oh, and he's paying for Lori, for Swearham DJ as well. Did Swearham DJ get knocked off? 
So I'm DJs in the Netherlands and Lori in Finland. Boy, these Finns, man, they're covering everybody's bases. Uh, next thing you know, they'll be invading Russia for us. You know, anyway, but <laughs> yeah. no, but, uh, but seriously. So so export based on compensation is uh, farmland. Sure, that's part of it. But it's about cowing your political uh, opposition. Anybody that speaks out against the government under expropriation of that compensation, which would become the law of the land, if that were the case, they'll threaten you. They'll take your bank accounts away. They'll take away your retirement. They'll take away your savings accounts, your investments, your car, your house, your jewelry, everything. It's not simply about righting wrongs on farmland. It's about suppressing political dissent. And whatever party is the ruling party of the day, whether it's the ANC or you know, the DA one day, people will use it. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I know it's a trite phrase, but it's true. That is all about that. And, and just keep going. Every one of these steps is about controlling people and giving the party in power absolute control over you to destroy you and silence you if you dare speak up against them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And where's the democracy in that? And that's the question that we should all, always be asking. The, there seems to be a, a slow but steady erosion of democracy. And it's obviously a deliberate move. Once governments get a, get a taste of, of power, they, without a doubt, want to cling on to it. And um, nothing, you know, nothing craves power more than a, than a liberation party or an ex, ex-liberation party. And that's why they always create the idea that uh, there's oppression and it's a minority uh, causing that, that oppression and so on. It's always a wonderful escape, you know, scapegoat. There has to be a, a liberation movement without liberation is is nothing it's literally stagnant so that's the problem here in south africa is that there's always this thing this push back into the past and the wrongs of the past and even though it was three decades ago you know they they, they still play play a major role in in our politicians minds and unfortunately that gets pushed on onto onto the people and those that react are literally the, the fringe the fringe activists and the fringe, fringe radicals but unfortunately, they always seem to have the loudest voice and get the most attention, especially from the media. And the media love, love those, those kind of stories. They love uh, supporting the so-called underdog. And it's all about clickbait. And I think that's perhaps what's wrong with the media. You know, I had a, a good long think about this, is that media, media are, have, have evolved. They no, no longer report factual news. It's always opinion presented as as news and the idea is because they've now moved, shifted away from selling newspapers to online online sales and online sales require a great number of clicks so we can sell those those adverts and and charge more for them create an impression of a busy website and that whole notion has really corrupted the factual news reporting it no longer exists it no longer exists at all. If you had to take the advertising revenue away from news, perhaps we'd actually see real news resurfacing. Well, you've actually, you've touched on something that's a very valid point here, which people never really string together. And let me, let me thread a little bit, get the clearer there so it makes sense to people. So what you're talking about is that when you sell newspapers, you either have a subscription, an abonnement, where people get, they, they, they get it all the time, they pay a flat fee, you get it delivered, or either through the mail or a news newsboy or girl, you know, Paper boy, paper girl delivers it. So, or a newsstand. So you make money that way, either either through a subscription or the newsstand where somebody goes and buys it. And you only sell the paper once. If someone takes it home and doesn't read it, <laughs> there's no skin off your nose, right? Unless you're just hoping to get a following. Um, but you've got the revenue. Now, it's different online where people go and much of the content is free. And the content that isn't free involves advertising. And if you read one article, they get a fraction of a cent. If you read another article, they get another fraction of a cent. And they have to aggregate these clicks and views in order to make the revenue to even come close to being commensurate with what they used to get by simply selling newspapers. And I think that's the part that people miss out on. They don't catch it. So how do you keep people clicking? With clickbait. You know, it's it's ridiculous. Um, in the old days, it was always, you know, on the paper, you know, people never read below the fold. That was the story, right? So the paper's folded over there. They read the first few headlines. And there's a lot of truth to that. And, you know, if the story starts on the front page, you have to go to page 16. And it's, you know, it's over here. Uh, unless you're really engrossed in the story, people don't read it. On clickbait, it's a similar thing. But the way they do it now is that it's just the headline is misleading. And then they'll start telling the story. And the truth may come out way down here, but who's down here reading that? And you're moving on to the next one. So they've got to get you to click, 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 click in order to make revenue. And I think that's an important point that a lot of people just don't get with the news. And, and I've said this for a long time. I, I'm in, in violent agreement with you is that 
most of the news is simply op-ed disguised as news. And I find it disgusting. Listen, when I report the news, I offer op-ed. But you know that. I tell you that up front. I even tell you my bias. And I also tell people don't trust me implicitly. <laughs> Go read for yourself. If you disagree with me, that's fine. I don't mind when people disagree. If they're insulting and rude, I have a problem with that. But if you disagree with me, that's fine. If your assessment yeah. of what's happening in, in Ukraine is different than mine, fine. But my assessment comes with three plus decades of intelligence experience, working at multiple agencies at the tactical, operational, strategic level, having written for the highest political figure on the planet, the president of the United States, and also written for the lowest level at the tactical level and done it on multiple continents on multiple topics. You know, so it's not like I'm just some dude sitting around eating Fritos on his couch, wearing his shorts, going, oh, no, it's this Ukraine thing, man. I think that's what's going on. No, there's actually some <laughs> substance behind it. That doesn't mean I'm right, although I almost always am. <laughs> but it does, yes, it does exactly. mean it does mean that that you know you need to be honest. And they're not honest. They're not honest. And none of them are honest in the news. They pull the crap all the time with opinion. I've called out so many Max Boot the other day, who's an author. He had a piece in the Washington Post. Such a hit piece against uh, conservatives in this country, and so dishonest. And he looked right past the exact same argument made about conservatives that leftists do and didn't even bring leftists into the yeah. conversation. It's just, it's so dishonest. It's, and, but, and you see that everywhere. It's crazy stuff. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely is, is horrific. And yeah, yeah, for those, those investigative journalists that actually do, do the thorough work. And, you know, if we didn't have them, then I don't think we'd ever know what is really going on. But they, they also seem to be uh, presenting opinion now rather than, rather than fact. And, and I, I, I think it will actually, spread into the independent journalists as well because youtube and other channels are structured that way we need exciting news we need those catchy headlines and we need that to to make revenue perhaps the perhaps the um perfect model well there's never a perfect model but a better model would be to have a non-profit organization that that uh, runs news you you pay for it as as you like it and yeah, I suppose so. Uh, no, 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 no. I didn't want to interrupt you. I was, uh, the, 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 uh, but I will interrupt <laughs> now. But no, no, it's okay. But but that's not a guarantee either. So so, yeah. and, and I'll take this back mm -hmm. to a conversation I had with Vian Dutoy yesterday about his radio station. Let me just tie these two things together very well. But but the problem is that like you have NGOs that become political as well. And, you know, so Human Rights Watch is a very political organization. They can claim they're not, but their reporting on Zimbabwe is virtually silent and human rights abuses yes. and political abuses there, extrajudicial killings, rapes of members of parliament. They're almost entirely silent. They have reported on it, but they should be reporting it all the time. Yet they focus laser sharp on things like the United States has the death penalty. That's inhumane. Really? 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 Okay, I mean, that's a position, fine, but be consistent. You don't talk about Myanmar's death penalty. That's not something you're talking about. You know, they execute people all the time. So yeah. so there's a danger there they can become political. Now, the reason I mentioned this is yesterday, Ovain Dutoy was on the channel for Fireside with the Colonels, our program, and we talked about this. He's got a radio station they're putting together, and it's going to be an entertainment, a news station. I'm going to have a program on there. At least that's the plan. Um, it's an Afrikaans language uh, network, but there'll be some English programming, and my news program will be one of it. Hopefully that that wow. follows through. I'd love to be on there. But wow, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, it'd be pretty cool. So I, there's another network that offered me something, and they they are still getting off the ground two years later, so I'm not going to hold my breath on that. I'll be collecting, you know, sitting in a rocking chair, collecting retirement by the time that thing's up but this one's <laughs> this one's moving along pretty well so so anyway but he said you said um one of the the challenges and we talked about this is that is he wants to keep it focused on what it, it's supposed to be about the culture of it and i said yeah i got you i said you know that happens in business all the time and especially in the media people start things for a reason and you know making money is fine there's nothing wrong with that that's what a business should do and a nonprofit shouldn't make money but it should make enough to cover its expenses and its activities so that's not like making a profit but it's making enough revenue i should say but what happens is that other people come in and take over i mean look at twitter right now twitter was not a leftist hate wanking platform when it started it was just a place where everybody went and it was it was like the wild west you could pretty much say and do what you want as long as you weren't doing harm well it became a leftist you know hate uh, mongering site and now Elon Musk is is having fun. He's he's having a blast with Twitter, and and they're they're running scared. Why? Because he's refused a board seat, which means he can keep gobbling up shares. If he gets fifty plus one, 
He can dictate what that company does and there's nothing they can do about it. And he has the cash on hand. He sold $50 billion worth of stock this year. And even after paying the U.S. government $13 billion in taxes, he's still got $37 billion from that and that could buy up a good chunk of, of Twitter. He got 9% for just $2.9 billion. So 10 times that'd be $30 billion. Well, there you go. So they could take over the whole company. My point is that is that the danger with the news is that it might be... The Economist is a good example, Rob. The Economist, in my view, I had a subscription for over three decades and I, 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 I so value the economist not because i agree with them in fact i oftentimes disagree with them but because they covered events around the world and they were objective and there's no byline so it's not like ooh, this is chris wyatt's article he's doing it for attention like we see in the washington post or news 24. it was anonymous but if you were a writer and you wrote for the economist and you went to work somewhere else People are going to, you know, they're going to see your work. You can show examples of it. So so it wasn't about ego. It wasn't about um, anything other than, you know, business focused and, you know, and basically conservative capital market stuff. Well, in 2003, when the Iraq campaign started, about six months into it, they put an image. And this is when I, I, I knew that they had lost it and, and I wasn't going to be able to stay with them. But I only canceled my subscription a year and a half ago after well over 30, 30 years. They had a picture of Blair and Bush on there and they titled it, Weapons of mass deception. Because after six months, no one found nuclear bombs. Well, they were never going to find nuclear bombs. I could have told you that in March before they invaded. I was working the National Security Agency, but I couldn't disclose that. There are no nuclear bombs in Iraq. It's not about nuclear bombs. The Bush administration foolishly allowed the press to latch on, and they encouraged them to say this is about weapons of mass destruction because that's sexy, and that's what will get people behind stopping him. Never mind the genocide of the Marsh Arabs. Never mind the ecological damage of damming and destroying the Euphrates uh, estuaries. Never mind the extrajudicial killing. The list goes on and on and on. All the crimes that this regime had done. No, we need something sexy. So when they put weapons of mass deception on there, six months after the conflict had started, before this case was even totally resolved, I knew that they were being fraudulent. And ever since then, it's gone from being something focused on to being something that's pushing green agenda, something that's pushing now homosexuality. All these things that have nothing to do with business. And they're just frauds. And so The Economist, a publication that's been around since 1843, went from a reliably conservative publication to one which I can't even stomach to read anymore. I just delete the emails. I get emails every day because I'm still on the list. I don't even read them anymore. I mean, I read it cover to cover. Rob, I would read the book reviews in there for boring books about Soviet authors back in the 80s. I'm like, oh, you know. But I read the thing <laughs> cover to cover. And, and I would disagree with a lot of it, but that was fine. But they're the only ones covering Kyrgyzstan, South Ossetia, Georgia, Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, Rwanda. I could go to The Economist. Now I could care less. And that's the hazard. Even with a, a, non, a, a not-for-profit NGO news site, the same thing can happen. Yeah, it, it can. So it, I suppose it's just down to uh, maintaining your your ethics and your morals and and sticking to 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 your cause. Which how do you do that? Because you, you you can't do that internally because you get stuck inside your own bu bubble and then suffer from your own own hubris where you think you're doing doing good and you think you're exceptional, but you're not noticing what other people are saying and and the advice that they give you. Should there be a, a press ombudsman or oversight body yes. that that does that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There and every, every publication, yeah. back in the day, when I was early in journalism before I went in the Army, every major publication had an ombudsman. And and they mm -hmm. were independent. They would sanction it. Like the Washington Post used to have one, if I'm not mistaken. And if the Washington Post did something was inappropriate, people brought it to their attention or they could investigate their own, they would sanction and and the, and the paper would follow that because they were independent. But getting someone who's independent like that is tough these days who will do the right yeah. thing. We have in this U.S. Senate, we have someone who's like that. It's called the Senate Parliamentarian. It's the only place in the U.S. government where parliament comes into play. We have a Senate parliamentarian who last year prevented the Senate from doing certain actions because it violated the Senate's own rules. And they were going to go ahead with it anyway because political parties have power and they tried to push it through. And the Senate parliamentarian put the kibosh on it and said, nope, you can't do this. It violates your rules. And, 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 and we stick to that for now. When every news organization must have an ombudsman. They must. I mean, absolutely. There's no question about it. But most of them don't. It's kind of like, you know, back when we were younger, all these major outlets had offices and bureaus all over the world. You know, in Africa, there'd be a bureau in Joburg. There'd be a bureau in Nairobi. There'd be one in, in, in Lagos. There'd be, there'd be seven or eight across the continent of Africa covering news in Africa. Now, every news event that's covered in Africa comes out of Joburg. Everything. People are covering the Central African Republic from Joburg. No one's in, in the Central African Republic. They're just getting reports and social media stuff from people on the ground and then turning into news, news in Joburg and then spreading from our African correspondent. What, sitting in Joburg? We're talking about Somalia, man. You have no credibility whatsoever. 
<laughs> I think that's exact. I've seen that so so often. There's something happens on on Twitter, and journalists yeah locally pick pick it up, and suddenly it's headline news. And then it turns out that it was a total fake story, and someone has egg on their faces. And we've seen we've seen that quite often with big publications, including I think the Mail and Guardian. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, they 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 suffered from quite a bit of a humiliated humiliating strike there when they reported something that was truly fake news as as being real. Uh, was it the Mail and Guardian, or or was it? Um, one of our other esteemed i think i think they've all been called at one time or another they've all probably, but but, yeah. but before yeah. before we go any further and people <clears throat> accuse me of being a hypocrite because i do something similar let me be clear about that i'm not a major media outlet i am a news outlet i am a journalist i do report things for and not being on the ground but i'm not a journalist who just went to journalism school and went in into the field the field being an office in manhattan or in Joburg, and report the news from there I'm a human being that's been on the ground, that's been to these places, been around, has life experience, has been an intelligence analyst, published thousands of times in that community, and a published author in academic circles, and I'm a person that brings analysis and thought to what I'm talking about. So I just reported, this is a perfect example, I just reported on New York City and Brooklyn. I'm not in New York. Where did I get the news from? I went to the media sites. I read what they read. I looked at what was plausible. It made sense. I know the train. I double-checked to look where it was, and I gave an analysis of what we know now to calm people down. So that hyperbole and excitement and over and, and, and misreporting isn't in place. And what I reported is either demonstrably provable or I presented it as this was reported by this organization. I have no independent verification. That's very different than what the mainstream media are doing. Very different. They seldom are honest about no independent verification or, you know, this is where the information came from. They, they're not honest about that. They may, they may point it out in the article, but they don't focus on it. And the veracity, it's like what's going on in the Ukraine. I mean, I've been calling out proper again on both sides but especially on the ukrainian side since the beginning i mean the super ukrainian fighter who shot down 30 russian planes and one come on man that's ridiculous you know and so when i was a young officer we had a uh, an exercise in which um it came down to me the generals and my boss who's a full colonel and i was a lieutenant i should have been a major but i was only a lieutenant that's it was a major position uh, several levels above my grade but i was good at my job and they kept me there so so they, they, they turn around to me and say so wyatt should we go and I said, sir, looking at the conditions of what we expect to happen at this hour, I think that we should continue to do this deep battle mission to attack this uh, this uh, tank regiment in that battle, um, in that battle, um, uh, the engagement area. Excuse me. So uh, so they sent them. And then my boss came back after it was over and said, uh, Chris, um, what do you plan on doing after the Army? I said, sir, well, I mean, you know, we lost 17 of those 18 Apache helicopters that got shot down by air defense. What? <laughs> okay. So my immediate response is that couldn't be. So I went and looked at it and one 2S6, which is a uh, missile and a, and a cannon system, shot down 17 Apaches in less than 30 seconds in the computer. That's physically impossible. They're not even that close. You, you can't, you'd have to detonate a nuclear weapon on top of them to knock down 18. Anyway, so my point is that, you know, I... I I take the implausible and I tear it apart. And, and, and so so what I do is very different. Now, there was a question here a moment ago. Let me get this, Rob. I don't want to get too far away from it. Dirk Britt says, Colonel Chris, when will you engage online live with one of the left parties? Well, Dirk, you're going to have to be more specific. One of the left parties, who? An individual or are you talking about the EFF or, or the ANC? I have invited the ANC on my program a few times and not even gotten a response. Not even a courtesy of responding and saying no. At least with a DA, they respond and say no. <laughs> you know, <that's> a, <laughs> with a few, well, with a few, say yes. <laughs> with a few exceptions. Um, but um, yeah, but I've, I've, I, but I have said this. I will not interview the EFF. They're just race hustlers. They they they're not legitimate. They are just um, they're just they're, they're, so I'm not going to interview them. But I've interviewed people from the Patriotic Alliance. Don't agree with the Patriotic Alliance at all. Um, I've interviewed people from the Inkata Freedom Party, including the head of the Inkata Freedom Party. No, it's not Mangosudo Butelezi. He's no longer the leader of the party. He's still a member of parliament, even as a nontogenarian. But I've interviewed people from all over from different political parties in South Africa that I disagree with. I've had them on. Um, I had, and I say this unequivocally, I had the most comprehensive non-mainstream media coverage of the 2020 municipal elections. Go back on my channel, look for all the interviews I did. I interviewed uh, representatives from, I think, eight or nine different political parties across South Africa, including the heads of parties like the IFP and others, and uh, the mayor, mayoral candidate for for um, uh, Itaquini, or Ikerhalini, excuse me, Ikerhalini, which was um, Refue uh, Mshake, who's a brilliant politician in the DA. She was one of the few DA people who's willing to come on the channel. Um, yeah, so, I, I, but as far as leftists, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with a leftist as long as they're 
they're they're not disrespectful or racist. I'll be happy to talk to them, but they just aren't willing to come on. See, the problem with that, Dirk, is that it takes very little effort for myself. Now, I'm not saying Rob is a conservative or or or, or I don't know where his political views are, although I, I think I might be able to divine it. But but it takes very little for a cogent adult like Rob or myself to destroy, eviscerate, you know, it's the entrails spilling out on the podium of one of these leftists because virtually none of them are all that bright. Few of them have any arguments. <laughs> the argument is, okay, we should distribute, distribute wealth. Why? Well, because it's just. <laughs> well, what is just? Well, okay, so is just you distribute my wealth and give it to poor people, yet you get to be a member of parliament and get a huge salary and a blue light escort and free rides on domestic air flights for five years? And a health plan for the rest of your life? What, what do I get? You took all my wealth away. I earned it. I should be able to buy those things. But I can't anymore because you've impoverished me by taking my wealth away. Speaking of which, I just finished my federal taxes this morning. Finally got them done. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I paid 53% of my consulting income to the government in taxes. And then they have the audacity to tell me that my effective tax rate was 12%. I don't know what planet they're on. But I can do the math. This dollars, this taxes, that's 53%. Anyway, so yeah. No, it's... Uh, it's, uh, anyway, I, I digress, but uh, I'll talk to leftists, but they've got to. And then John Jarvis said that Elon would need $300 billion. Um, I'm not sure how that works. If he paid $2.9 billion for 9% of the company, that means he probably needed $3 billion to pay for 10%, roughly. So that would mean a $30 billion company, not a $300 billion. I, I don't know the current valuation of Twitter. Uh, I'd be sure. Whoa, Francesca. <laughs> she doesn't agree. She, no, she says, no, $30 billion. No, no. What is that in... in in dog currency. <laughs> <laughs> John Jarvis, um, uh, it, it actually, um, it was uh, reported, and Musk, uh, Musk never confirmed, but it was reported that he accepted the board position, and then he declined it. I think he may have accepted or told him he's going to accept it, and he was just messing with him. The problem is that um, Securities Exchange Commission rules prevent him from owning more than 14.9% of the outstanding common stock if he's a board member. Oh, wow. So so okay. uh, when, when, when Twitter made that offer, I said this is their effort to keep him from, oh, from buying out the company from a hostile takeover because he can't own all the stock. So when he turned it down, it seems pretty obvious to me that he's either messing with them or he's going to make a play for the company. So he's got the resources to do it. But anyway, uh, but look, I don't trust him. Well, I don't trust him. You don't Musk. trust him. No, yeah. no, no, no. No, I mean, him. I like him. I'm impressed, you know, PayPal impressed. I'm impressed with SpaceX, with Starlink, not with mm -hmm. Tesla. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I said this with Wyatt yesterday. I don't really trust people whose business model is dependent on subsidies and tax breaks to make their vehicles affordable so people sure. buy them. Uh, sure. And that's part of his business model. So, I mean, I shouldn't be subsidizing somebody who's rich buying a $55,000 Tesla. That's nonsense. Just like I shouldn't be subsidizing people who put $40,000 of solar panels on their house. Either the panels can be made at a profitable cost or they can't. If they can't be, then the technology doesn't work and it doesn't work. That's the bottom line. It only works when people get a huge tax break and then poor people pay for that. That's like, you know, free college. Less than 1% of all people on this planet ever attend university. Now in the US, it's about 25 to 35% of Americans go to university, but or more sometimes. But in the world, 1% of human beings get to go to university and attend it, whether they graduate or not, they get to attend it. So why should plumbers and bricklayers and people picking berries pay taxes so that freeloaders get to go to university and get an income 10, 20 times larger than theirs annually. How is that fair? It's not fair. You go to university, you pay for it. University is not necessary to survive in this world. Literacy is. You need to be literate. That's why primary and secondary education should be universally free on the planet, in my view. And as a small government person, I have no objection to that because we have responsibility to inculcate and train the next generation of our progeny so they can move into the workforce and function. But university, that's a privilege. And if you go, you yeah. should pay. Now, if you can't afford it, we can have... I absolutely agree. We can have grants for poor people. We can have loans. But this forgiveness of loans... I don't think so. You're going to get a job making $200,000 a year and my neighbor makes $40,000 a year working at Walmart and he's going to pay for your tuition because you're a rich, spoiled, white person. Screw you. Screw you. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I fully support that that notion as well. Basic education should absolutely be be free. It should not should not be a, a for-profit driven driven initiative because uh, everybody is entitled to to good ed good education whether it's private education or or state driven education it it should be it should be free for or accessible to to everyone university is exactly as you say it's, it's a privilege it's a privilege not everyone gets to do it in fact some of the the wealthiest individuals in in many countries around the world have no degrees at all so oh, bill gates no degree really, no degree. So really, it's, it's, it's up to the individual and how they perform and how they perceive the world. And you, oh, I don't know, I, I think there's 
the tertiary education is becoming less and less valuable. It, it's now just a piece of paper and a tick box. Employer, employers aren't, aren't even looking at qualifications anymore. There's a definite shift towards experience and knowledge and reputation and track record being, being high priorities than, than qualifications, simply because the standard of education in tertiary, tertiary institutions has, has declined. You don't know. You don't know what you're getting. Somebody can have the, the the paper and all the qualifications, but can they do the job at the end of the day? No. So, yeah, I don't value it at all. But uh, which is quite controversial. I come from quite a academic family. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, but Rob, I think I think you and I are probably of the same opinion here. I think we'll violently agree. So you tell me if if, if we differ, but I don't think we do. Listen, I, I mean, I, having a, a degree doesn't mean squad as far as whether you're a cogent, lucid, intelligent, thoughtful, and dedicated person with drive and energy to accomplish things. It doesn't mean anything. Agreed. It simply Agreed. means now, depending on the level of education, it simply means that you have the determination and the commitment to sit down and learn something and achieve something. But that doesn't make mean your whole life. And also, a lot of times people work in fields completely unrelated to what the degree is. So I believe in education. I believe in higher education. And I believe that everyone who has the desire and the wherewithal, not from a financial, but from an ability standpoint, should have the opportunity to go to university within reason. Not to do gender studies necessarily, but, you know, to go to university. I mean, I have an associate degree. I have a bachelor degree. I have three advanced master's degrees. I have attended university my entire life in residence through distance education, through correspondence course. And right now I'm enrolled at Michigan State University. I'm becoming an apiest. No, I'm not going to train apes. That's a beekeeper. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm learning how to be a beekeeper because it's important for the environment. Wow, look at this conservative Republican guy. He's talking about the environment. Yeah, because I'm a conservationist, not a lunatic leftist climate change religion zealot. <laughs> You know, but uh, bees are critically important to the chain in nature. So I'm, I'm learning how to be a beekeeper. It's been a lifelong interest of mine. Now I have the time to do it. And that's through university. So I continue my education. And, and that's great. And, and if people aren't able to continue education or don't have an interest, that's fine. But that doesn't make me smart or brilliant or dedicated or successful. It's just part of something that's in my kit bag. And that's how I look at education. Do we disagree or do we agree on those issues? I think we agree. Absolutely agree. Your 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 willing to go and study is is based on the thirst for information. And yes, knowledge. it is. <laughs> and, and there's there's no doubt about that. Whereas uh, most people who attend university, that's definitely not the case. So, yeah, you know, I'm I, look. I'm I'm I can't speak from experience because I, I haven't attended university. But the what? <laughs> Wow, the IQ quotient for this program just uh, now. See, I just gave myself away. I said the IQ quotient. That's redundant, oh. isn't it? The intelligence the quotient, I, the IQ quotient. That would be quotient, redundant. Quotient. Yeah, exactly. The IQ level in this program has just decreased demonstrably because it Rob has, has never gone to university. How I'm dare so we get a non-university graduate on this program? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I know I've, I've just have an inability to to study for, for or even read a book for any, anything longer than than say an hour. I get distracted and go have to go to something else. I've never been never been able to study at, at all. But as I said, I did come from uh, well, I do come from a very academic family, incredibly academic, full time. So you're, uh, you're the outlier. Without a doubt, you're the black sheep. Without literally, he's wearing a black turtleneck tonight. <laughs> Without a doubt, yes. <laughs> and that that's me. But wait, wait, that's uh, racist. Black sheep. No, sorry, I digress. <laughs> 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 Three bags full, sir. But yes, exactly. It's a. I, I think it's actually it's actually helped me uh, quite a bit, especially through 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 my whole life. It's mm -hmm. and the careers that and and jobs and and responsibilities that I've had definitely require more of a, a lateral thinking than than vertical thinking. Mm -hmm. And academics tend to think vertically and very rarely think think laterally, and it's also underst understandable. Uh, the longer you are in in academia in a single field, the more narrow your your vision does tend to become. You eventually become an expert in 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 nothing but but your field. That is <laughs> the problem. So, uh, I, I I love I crave knowledge as well as, as much as you do, and I, I get that knowledge by looking at absolutely everything and finding out and discovering for myself and and so on and. Anybody can do that. The, the resources are out there, they're available. Um, we just have to have the initiative to actually do it and not get distracted by by the crap. Put it that yeah. way. Put it no the, doubt about the it. Rubbish. 
I agree with you. And that is like social media and that all, that all that kind of stuff. The, we need to more, move away from an entertainment society and more into let's let's do some research in something that we enjoy and find our find our passion in in, in that route. And maybe the world will be a better place then if people were just allowed to do do what they want. And you know, I think that whole shift from from our generation where you had to, and I'm actually just I'm actually just rehearsing or recalling conversation I had with with my with my daughter. I think it was yeah. You, you, in, in our generation, you got a job, you chose a career, and you stuck to that for until you until retirement age. That no longer applies at all anymore. If if somebody stays in in a job or a field for more than two years, there it's it's abnormal. They jump and change around and sort of segue from one one uh, role into another role and one one career into another career. And I, I kind of like that because that's pretty much what, what I've done. Yeah. It's I treat, you treat life as a journey and see where it takes you. And if it's a total different shift in where, where you were going, so what? It's an, it's an adventure. But you retain the knowledge that you've gained throughout those, those different fields. And, build, exactly, and you build the layers on top of it and you create something yeah. that's unique and, and amazing from, from those experiences. Yeah, so it's... It's just a total mindset shift. That's all it is, where you become self-empowered and and more responsible for your own future rather than relying on, on a career and a good paying job and a good salary in the same company for years because of the benefits and, and so on. How boring. How boring is that? Well, I got you. Well, that's that's one of the reasons why I was in the uniform, you know, and why I became an intelligence officer. I mean, you know, people might go, well, you're in the Army for 36 years, you did the same thing. <laughs> no, I never did the same thing in the Army. I may have I may have had similar responsibilities in different jobs, but it was never the same thing. Trust me, being the security cooperation chief in Liberia meant rebuilding a post-conflict society and security sector reform when most people that were involved, in, including the United Nations, had no idea what the hell security sector reform was. We were literally developing doctrine for this concept as like building up, you know, building a plane in flight sort of thing. Uh, very different than being the security cooperation chief in Botswana or being an attache in Tunisia or being a staff officer in Stuttgart or being a university lecturer at Iowa State or at the Army War College. And, you know, when it comes to the, the so I'm kind of like you. It's, 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 and I've also, I was a journalist before when the Army, I was a dairy farmer when I was a kid. All these things have built life experiences. I found all, and now I'm studying about being a beekeeper. Not that I'm going to be a commercial beekeeper, but I think it's a useful skill to know about and understand the world. So the thirst for knowledge and and the, the jumping from place to place. And that's why I feel so, not stagnant right now, but one of the reasons why the, the broadcasting YouTube is so important to me is because every day is different. I'm reporting on news, new areas, diving different things, doing research and different videos I'm making because I'm chained. I mean, I, although that, I'm breaking free of the chains this year. I've had enough of this. I'm traveling off to Texas in June to cover rugby. I'll be giving some other trips abroad this year. I finally, screw them. You know, they want to lock me down. They're going to have to chase me through the airport. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> so, but I mean, it, it, that's why this stuff is so important because it allows me to not be stagnant and, and keep expanding that knowledge and building upon it. But you talked earlier about this, this info, uh, getting away from this entertainment sort of mindset. And I think we're both agree that you're talking about getting to critical thinking. People need to be in inculcated with the skills to be critical thinkers, not critical or criticizing, but critical thinkers. And, you know, thinking about things critically, like I explained a few minutes ago, but I think there's another piece to that. And that's the adulation nonsense that's in our societies. I mean, you see it in the, in the Europe with the, you know, the fawning over royals and countries, even the countries don't have royal families in Germany. Ooh, you know, the, 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 the house of Saxe Coburg and all these knights and nobles and stuff, they, they still get all gaga over that stuff. In America, it's like, Ooh, Ooh, Lady Gaga, Ooh, the Cardassians, <laughs> Ooh, the Brian James, you know, that, that adulation, which is a human trait, I believe, it's hard to stamp it out, really needs to be tamped down. Between adulation and infotainment, we've really distort the reality of this world, and people can get away with making all sorts of claims that aren't even remotely based in fact. Now, there's two things I need to address in the chat very quickly. One is I think I may have misinterpreted or inferred incorrectly what John Jarvis said regarding Twitter and the amount of money, so if I inferred incorrectly, my apologies for that. And I didn't mean to mislead if I did. So just, I'm not sure I did, but I just want to make sure I get that out before we wrap this up today. And there was another question here. Um, let me find it very quickly here. Why are people talking about the UIM? That's not what it was. Um, 
Gosh, mm. bless it. Where was this at? Oh, here it is. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard Lemmer asked this question. I don't know if you can answer it, Rob, but I'll ask it of you. Uh, your opinion on Morning Shots interview. Ramon, Ramon, uh, Ramon Kabanek uh, interviewed a Russian diplomat from the uh, embassy there. Uh, did you watch that? And if you did, what's your opinion? I didn't watch it, but I do have an opinion. But go ahead. No, I actually didn't. I didn't watch it, but sorry, Ramon. He's, he's going to shout at me in about five minutes. I guarantee He's not, not here. If he is, he's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Ramon never comes to my channel anymore. He's always here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Joe Biden. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't watch it. That, that, that was. Uh, I can't comment on that. Okay. Well, I, I'll comment. My, my thoughts are this. Um, congratulations. That sounds like a coup, information-wise. But um, I hope you don't get a strike from YouTube. <laughs> 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 you do realize that you can't talk to Russians. They're 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 evil incarnate. It's the second coming exactly. of Genghis Khan. You can't talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. You must ban Tchaikovsky. Burn all your DVD, your CDs <laughs> in your house. You can't read Alexander Solzhenitsyn and the Gulag Archipelago. It's un. Acceptable Dostoevsky. Burn those books because Russians are <laughs> evil, evil people. Anyway, oh, so. funny. You know, <laughs> I, I had I had someone coming to look look at our look at our house for for evaluation, yeah. and it was quite recently, and um, she was from the bank, and she was clearly Russian, absolutely clearly Russian, thick accent, uh, the right name, it, everything. And I was, I was like, oh, are you Russian? And she's like, no, no. I'm not Russian. I'm well, not Russian. I'm, so, I'm Serbian. I'm Serbian. Uh, so, so, so that's <laughs> see, that's what's happening now. So, for years, especially in the West, if you're in the UK, but more so in the States, if you meet a Nigerian, uh, you're from Africa. You always ask him. Uh, I'll run into the Home Depot or at, at you know at a restaurant like that. Oh, oh so um, where are you from? Africa. Yeah, like that's not a big place, right? Now you don't say that to them, but yeah, no, I realize that. But I mean, obviously, you're from West Africa, and they're kind of oh, 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 like you know, I'm from West Africa. Where are you from? I'm from Ghana. You're not from Ghana. That's not a Ghanaian surname. What are you, Ibo or Yoruba? Oh, I'm from Nigeria. How do you know this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Nigerians are always Ghanaians in America because it, it looks yeah. more favorable. Now, if you're isn't Russian. That, isn't that sad? Now, yeah, it is sad. <laughs> now, if you're Russian from around the world, you're from Serbia. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, right. And, you know, it's quite sad. I, I, I wasn't going to, she obviously thought that it, now Russians have a bad stigma. Yeah. And I was saying, oh, don't come into my house because you're Russian and you're evil. But it was just purely just an observation. And I was like, yeah, yeah. there we go. No, you're but just shame. being friendly. Like, There's nothing sorry. wrong with that. Yeah. Mm. But you she know, it's, felt prejudiced enough to, to say no, to of deny course. her. And that's her, sad. Her heritage. No one it should ever deny sad. their heritage. No one should be. If you're a Zulu, if you're a Kosa Venda, an Afrikaner, Portuguese, you know, Jewish, whatever your heritage, you shouldn't be. You should, no. Unless you did it, you're not responsible. I'm not responsible for people who owned slaves 200 years ago. I have nothing to do with that. I, I, I gain nothing from that other than I exist today because somebody got busy in the bedroom or in the barn, wherever they got busy and had offspring, and I'm here today. But that has nothing to do with that. <laughs> uh, I'm not responsible for that. I'm not responsible for Woodrow Wilson's racism and airing The Birth of a Nation, a pro-Klan, pro-lynching movie, the first ever movie ever shown in the White House. I'm not responsible for that. That's Woodrow Wilson and his folks around him that did that. I didn't segregate the Federal Work Service. I, I, federal I, I did things to improve people's lives, and, and I can take pride in that and be happy about it and, 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 and sleep well at night. So, folks, you should be proud of who you are. You should have no problem with your heritage. If people came before you, made mistakes, and did things wrong, you must, before passing judgment, consider the context of the time and the era when these events occurred. Yeah. doesn't excuse things. Slavery should never be excused. But if you're looking at slavery, you have to look at it in the context, in an honest context. The United States is the only country in the world that ever fought a civil war to end slavery. And we lost mm. 600,000 plus lives, almost all men. And 97% or more of those lives lost were white men. And by the way, 98% of the people who lost their lives were not slave owners. On the, in the North and in the South. So those are facts. And so when you talk about what happened then, you need to put things in context, you know? The Brits, for all their foibles and global empire building, were the first nation to begin to interdict the slave trade in the modern era. They put a, a blockade on slave trading in West Africa and stopped slave ships and repaid. That's why we have Freetown in Sierra Leone. They'd find the, they'd find the ships where slaves are being smuggled to the Americas. They'd stop it. They just did this on their own unilaterally. What authority internationally did the British government have to stop Danish and Portuguese and Spanish ships from shipping slaves in Africa? They had no authority. They just stopped them, raided them, and dumped the, dumped the, uh, the slaves in Freetown or in Liberia and in Monrovia, and that's what happened. 
so folks understand the context and put it in proper context before you make evaluation judgment because our morals and mores today are not the mores and values of people 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. You have to understand. And 50 years from now, people are looking back at us and going, what a bunch of dunderheads. There aren't 1,000 genders. There are two, okay? <laughs> Apparently, exactly. they couldn't understand that in 2022. We have to explain that to our ancestors. That's what they're going to be saying. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, and I, I think what you've what you've highlighted highlighted there is is, is quite fascinating, and um, it's easy to see why there, there's a there's a strong move from from the leftists or radical leftists to erase history or, or rewrite history, because we certainly do, like, as you just mentioned, if all we have to do is look back in, in history to find those facts and understand the context, and and realize that it's it's a very different place. But if you erase that history. You can raise up the problems of the past and present them in in modern times totally out of context as as something that is that is evil and misguided. It's <laughs> it's I, I I just remembered a, a a piece from I think it was Bill Burr, the stand up stand up comedian. We was talking talking about the guy from Duck Dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> you you pull exactly you you pull out any any old white guy seven seventy year old plus white white guy uh, and put him on, put him in front of a camera and he's going to come across as racist simply because that's how he was brought up. Yeah, but that was the context really of his. Racist? That no. was the context of. <laughs> well, Rob, you make a very good point there. You know, so for instance, uh, okay, um, I, I didn't grow up using the N word. You know, in South Africa, of course, it's the K word, which is not even not for cons. It's it's Arabic, but anyway, that means unbeliever. But anyway, but so much for that. That's been appropriated, misappropriated. But um, and it's illegal to use it in South Africa, which I think is comical. It's sad. If you have to, if you have to regulate speech in that way, then there's really a problem. But uh, in America, I just didn't use the N word. It's not something I use. And and I lived in a housing project where 300 families and only three were white. The rest were black. Uh, I I came in the army where one third of the people around me were black, even though only 13 percent of the population is black because the enlisted force was heavily uh, uh, enlisted with black folks because it was a place they got a fair shake and there was job opportunities and they got skills and so they came in the army but uh, I never used that word I went back to Maryland in 19 when was this 19 it might have been like 1990 I think it was 1990 and before I went overseas and my mother came down from Ohio and I met some of my uncles and aunts a lot of family in Maryland and everywhere I went white folks and black folks were saying the n-word all the time and this and that now I noticed two things. One, I was like kind of taken aback because I'm not, no, it wasn't 90, it was 94 when I came back from Germany. I came back from 94 and it was 94. So I came back and 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 I, I kept hearing people say this all the time and I was a bit uncomfortable with it because it's just not a word I like. It's just, it's kind of a low class word in my view. Um, I mean, if you have to resort to, to the K word, I think it's just low class, same sort of thing. Anyway, uh, so I just was uncomfortable with it and um, not that I'm some lefty or something like that. It's just, I think I'm a rational person. So, but I did notice two things. I noticed that the white folks saying it, the black folks saying it, weren't saying it in a demeaning or derogatory fashion. It was just like, you know, how, how come the F word has become in English in America today? People say F all the time and it, it loses its meaning. You know, I call people racist anymore. It's lost its meaning. And so the N word pretty much lost its meaning unless it was used in a certain context. But people were using it and I just didn't like the word. So I told my mother, I said, mom, could you stop using that? I, said, that's, I, I don't hear that word in the army. I work around black folks all the time. And, and you know, it's just, I, and to my mother's credit, I never heard her utter the word once again. And I had never heard her say it very often. I'd heard her say it once or twice. And I said, I said, I never, she said, I never heard her say it once again. But she grew up at a time in the 50s when everybody said that, whether it was evil or malicious or not, it's a word they use. So for instance, here, when, when I explain to people all the time in America, when I say colors in South Africa, I have to give a caveat. No, it's not a 1950s derogatory racist term to describe black people. It's a cherished, valued term by a group of people or a specific ethnic group who grew out of European and Khoiansan and some Malaysian, Indonesian mix that came in there. And they have very distinct um, language, usually Afrikaans and often Dutch Calvinist and very specific appearance and skin tone texture and racial and and, and 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 facial features they're a distinct ethnic group and it's, it's a term of endearment many of them are happy to be called colored and i have to explain that to people so the point is that you have to understand the context of things now to be fair if my mother continued to use the n-word in my presence then i would have become offended and irritated over time but that was just what she said it's like the guy in duck dynasty the vietnam veteran the stuff that comes out of his mouth I'm like whoa dude you can't say that anymore you know you can't say that exactly. i mean when i was a kid everybody said that and you were an adult they were all saying that nah but you can't say that man you know it's uh but if, if people are willing to um accept 
that we don't all grow up in the same circumstances. And just because you grow up in different circumstances doesn't mean you're necessarily a bigot or a racist. Even though you say things that in, in someone's view today might be, then I think we're all better off. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's the whole, the whole issue about, about ethics as well. You can't determine uh, your own ethics. It's, it's determined by, by those you, who surround you and that you valued from, from, from outside, not, not from within. And I, I, it's exactly, it's exactly that. I think people should just be more accepting of, of others, not erase the history, as, as we said before, and uh, understand different cultures. And nothing expands your your mind and opens your eyes up to to different cultures than than travel and engaging with 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 other people outside of your your little bubble. You, you're a testament to that. You, you've traveled the world. You've seen uh, all all different cultures. You understand South African culture better than most South Africans do, and it's it, it's amazing. But a lot most people should be exposed to that. And majority, unfortunately, aren't, and that's that's where the problems start. We we try apply our set of, of ethics and our set of standards to another group of people and it, it, it doesn't happen. Especially in a diverse country um, like South Africa, it's incredibly diverse. And to try and accommodate everybody and, and get everybody to think the same and abide by the same set of moral standards is impossible. It's impossible. What we should be trying to do is get to understand each other and accept uh, the differences that, that are between our different cultures and subcultures. But no, government has other ideas. You're all going to abide by the same. And the left, left type thinking, socialist type of thinking is exactly the same. You've got to make everybody apply to the same set of standards set by government, determined by government, even down to the, even down to the core fundamentals like religion. Yeah. It's, we've got to throw it all out and the state becomes a religion. And I'm sorry, I, I just don't. What a boring society if we were all the same and Indeed. all doing the same thing. The society would stagnate 100 percent then sorry where, where's the adventure in that where's the advancement in that and what's the point in in that at, as well well it's one of the most appealing things for me about south africa i mean i love botswana but but let's be honest it's it's kind of uh, homogenous you know i mean it's it's mostly Botswana speakers 85 percent of the population uh, that doesn't mean it's you know but it's, it's 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 all pretty much the same folks it's still interesting but south africa with so many different ethnic groups so many different cultures so many languages different faiths i mean uh the fact that islam came to southern africa in the cape of good hope centuries ago and has been established there for a long time then a whole different immigration of 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 islam into kzn in the 19th century as a consequence of the brits being people bringing people in from the Indian subcontinent to work the sugarcane fields and such you have all you have that mix you have you have the Dutch Calvinist church you have you have all kinds you have ethnic Portuguese who fled from Angola and from Mozambique and came to South Africa and being part of a community you it's it's I find all that stuff fascinating it's one of the things that makes South Africa I mean it's a beautiful land gorgeous landscape lots of things to, to appeal from that standpoint but from a people standpoint a human standpoint it's very amazing and to to marginalize or remove or to demonize people based on being different it's just sad because it's really it's really an interesting part of it. Let me get some chat stuff here really quick before we wrap up. Um, so John Jarvis said the interview at Roman Kamenex did was very good. Check it out. Yeah, well, Roman does pretty good interviews. Not as good as mine, but they're pretty good. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, so. And Malcolm Clody gave a 140 rand super chat, which I rang the bell on. But thank you, Malcolm, for that stripper chat. Uh, no comments on it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and then below that, um, Ken Aronson says, "Marvelous show in all caps again with three x four exclamation points." Thank you for that. One, two, three, four, three or four. I can't. My eyes are off. And then Rebellious Ruth <laughs> says she couldn't agree more with something I said. Thank you for that. And um, oh, Coquetso Redsani is here. I saw somebody greet him, but there it is. Progressivism will be the undoing of society. Spot on, brother. Hey, Coquetso, should we do a Kenako tomorrow? If you're still here, answer that question. Because uh, I've done it. I've done a fireside with the Colonels on Monday. I've done uh, this with Rob today. Answer the question. And tomorrow I ask because starting Thursday and for the next couple weeks, I'll be at the work college and not available to do our program. I don't want to go a whole month without a program. So, Coquetso, if you and um, Dumo are up for that tomorrow, we can do a um, Kenako tomorrow. Just let me know. And welcome to Coquetso Rezani. And then what else? Mr. Punisher's here. And I'm just trying to see if I missed any comments we should Oh, Mr. B just gave a super chat. Mr. B is on a super chat roll here, man. We're going to have to do a fundraiser. We're going to bankrupt Mr. B. said, oh, dear, now we have Mr. B in Cape Town. <laughs> 
Anyway, folks, yeah. So, um, Rob, um, once again, let's get back to the, the the crux of the matter when we started this program. No, it's not the shootings in New York City, but um, the campaign to get the word out. 228,000, I think, was the number when we started the show. Let's see if anybody else has signed up for it. Uh, or 222,000, not 228. I, okay, fake news! Fake news! <laughs> it was 222,000. Yeah, yeah. It's only because I haven't up- updated the counter. <laughs> oh, do you, have to, you have to do that manually, or does it do it uh, with each one that comes in? No, no, we, we've actually split the database up to, to oh, make okay. the website more, okay. more efficient now, so we have to update it manually. Okay, so, so, so it's out of date then. So, But I mean, uh, yeah. okay, look, um, I, I think, let me, let, me, let me characterize this and, and, and get your thoughts on it. 222,000 comments is astounding. It's the biggest campaign mm-hmm. I think you've had on anything, and it shows some yeah. clear, and, and I think it's like 97% or more are against yes. these rules. Uh, that's mm-hmm. a clear statement on its own. But in some respects... I wonder if maybe you're a little disappointed. You're hoping to get 600,000, a million or something like that. I know I'm a little disappointed. I would expect louder outrage than this. You, you don't have to comment if you don't want to, but I mean, where are your thoughts on this? Are, are you really impressed with the 222,000? Grateful for that? Or, or you want to keep reaching for that yeah. star? Well, I think we'll definitely keep reaching for the star. It's, it's absolutely necessary. In fact, uh, I do believe this is one of the most important campaigns that, that we've ever run and, and one of the most important participation events that the government has ever put forward because the, the consequences are, are pretty dire if, if the, these regulations are, are put in place. And government doesn't normally uh, offer the public aid an opportunity to comment on regulations. So the fact that they did means that they, they want the public to, to, to comment. So that's why we were hoping for at least 1% of, of South Africans to actually to have a say, 600,000. But hey, there's only there's a, what, four days left or three days left we can we can still get those get those numbers up and you know, compared to our other campaigns i think it's it's done exceptionally well but it's it's lower than lower than expected but still time to go well <laughs> it's still time to go four days plus some hours left here and also folks you yeah. don't have to be south african to offer your commentary you, yeah, you can, you can be you can be an expat living abroad. You can be uh, an American like myself. You can weigh in on this. Uh, you're welcome to do it. Go to DRSA's website, DRSA.org, uh, and, and you can uh, click on that uh, thing and just go ahead and put your data in there and put your comments in there. Just be respectful. And don't be insulting. You don't use profanity. <laughs> I mean, not that it's going to offend DRSA, but I mean, they're, they're keeping a record of these things. You don't want you don't want someone to, you know, uh, when this goes to, if this goes to court two years ago, and they're pulling out random ones and go, well, look at this one from Chris Wyatt. You effing move. Oh, oh, oh. You don't really want that to be entered in a court as evidence. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and also don't forget that every single comment is immediately delivered as an individual comment from you to to government. And and of course, we keep a record of, of, of that all. So remember, you are speaking to, to uh, parliamentarians and to politicians. And well, I suppose you can remain anonymous. Wow. And, and well, well, see, Rob, so, so that that just runs counter. That just runs counter to the argument I just made. That's going to encourage <laughs> people to be insulting and use profanity if it's going oh, no. direct to members of parliament. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, but what what they offer is quality comments. So it's suggestions. Yeah. If you don't agree with it, then offer a reason why. Offer a solution. Mm-hmm. Offer an alternative. What what this what public participation is? It's actually an opportunity to negotiate with with government. Mm-hmm. Then you ne- government proposes policy that that is in their favor always, of course. Of course. And they offer the public an opportunity to negotiate it, and hopefully, government and and citizens meet in the middle and formulate effective policy that works for both sides. That's what it's about. So, offer those suggestions, make them good, provide good comment, and don't be crass. Doesn't doesn't help anyone. No, it doesn't really help anyone. You may feel great, may feel cathartic, but you'll regret it after the fact. You really will. Mm-hmm. It's never. It's never. Listen, I, I learned something a long time ago when Bill Gates was sued in Microsoft over monopolistic practices by um, crowding out Netscape back in the day. That's a long time ago, and putting Internet Explorer their garbage browser into their operating system, and mm-hmm. and, and not you know not not letting people. So they so they went to trial, and Bill Gates had been writing all these things where they were doing exactly that. They denied they were doing it. They're exactly trying to destroy Netscape by undercutting them, basically giving away free software, um, destroying Netscape's business model. So uh, that went to trial and Bill Gates, much to his chagrin, found out in the 1990s that email is subject to discovery. So email is considered evidence in a court case and they had to turn over their email servers and that's why Microsoft lost the antitrust action against Netscape. (laughs) So I learned a long time ago that- Bill Gates? 
Yeah. Have Bill Gates been deceptive? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, they learned how to do it offline after that. So anyway, but uh, but the point of that story was that um, there have been many times in the Army when I've been so angry about something, um, and I'll type up an email and because I'm in anger, and but I never send it. I save the draft or I copy the text and delete that and save it in a text file. So I go back later and I go, oh, I'm so glad I didn't send this because I would have regretted that email. I mean, we all get emotional in the moment. Well, not all of us, but most of us do. We get emotional in the moment and it's wise just to not do that. So well, my recommendation, if you go to DRSA's website, take the approach Rob said, think about ways you can be constructive, offer suggestions, what can be done, and then give your reasons why you think this is unjust or inappropriate or ineffective. And, you know, and then type it out in a separate thing in a text or a Word document, review it, make sure your spelling is good and all that stuff, you know, and then copy and paste it into the website and that'll get your, get your opinion. So please do it, folks. Please do it. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Excellent suggestion. And I, I often do the same as, as you, Chris. You know, there's nothing better than getting your frustrations out onto, onto paper or into an email. But you don't click send. You don't click send. You save that as a draft and, oh, okay, I've got it out. And I want to say this to my boss. And this is how it is. And you're an absolute beep, 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 beep. But you don't click send. You now, just now, get, if you, get, if, it out, get it out your head and vent. And if, you're, if you're on the political left of the aisle, I encourage you to send every emotional email every time. Whatever your thoughts are, pour them out on paper. You want to call people names? Do it. Put it in a tweet. Put it, yes. put it on your website. Put an email. Send it out there. Offend everybody. We would like to have <laughs> records of your behavior. <laughs> exactly. Find you from the left. There you go. On the left. That's right. Hey, Rob, I think we should wrap it up here. Thanks a lot. We're going to have a hiatus for the next couple weeks because I'll be at the War College, but we'll stay in touch. And um, if anything's breaking on this story, reach out to me. And I, you and I can do a short interview or something if you want to talk about what's Fantastic. with the campaign. We'll do that in the meantime because I can do that at different hours. It's not tied to the broadcast time. So any any last thoughts, Rob, before we wrap up this uh, session of Answer the Question? No, I think we would had a really, really good session. I, I really appreciate that. And Best of luck and, and good luck where, you, where, where you're going and kick some butt, make some, make some change, do some difference. I'm just throwing out words here that mean nothing at all. But <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, uh, I'm not going to be make, kicking any butts. I, I'm there in the role as a consultant. So my job is to provide a service. I'm not in a leadership role, unfortunately. I, if I was in charge, I'd do things a little bit differently. But I'm not in charge, so I provide a service that I was contracted for. But there you go. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and there's, there's a couple comments here that came in before we just wrap up. Uh, gosh, where did this go? Uh, Big Daddy Liberty stream last night was removed for some reason. Oh, uh, people are worried about Big Daddy Liberty. Um, apparently, he's tweeting like a storm up today. I don't know what happened. Maybe he removed it or maybe it got removed because of uh, it was mm. a strike. I don't know, but um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, maybe someone can find out from Coquetso has been reaching out to him, mm. but he's been busy. So, uh, And then um, Mr. B said, shame. He just saw on Telegram at least 45 people have died in the flooding in KZN. Uh, that's the first time I heard anybody had died in the flooding. I've, I've done a video and reported on that yesterday. So... I'll keep an eye on that. And Coquetso Rizzani offers some good advice here. <laughs> que a la oh, good advice coming from Coquetso. Yeah. Que a la boa, Coquetso. He says, always remember, folks, the same right you have to offend people is the same right you have to be offended by others. <laughs> ah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Good man. All right. Good man. All right. Cool beans. Uh, Rob, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. And let's get those million people support uh, DRSA to become subscribers to Chris White Africa. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. We'll send out a thank you email to every single one of them with a link to Chris Watcher. There All we right. go. Cool beans. All right, Rob, I'm putting you in the waiting room. I'll let you drop off. Um, take care of yourself and, and all the best to Francesca and your family. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Thanks a lot for the time. All right, cool beans. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Answer the Question with Rob Hutchison and Chris White. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to smash the like button. I'm not sure about a night out tonight. I might be going to the minor league baseball opener for the Harrisburg Centers. I'm debating about that. Plus, I need to go get a haircut right now. Be shorn. It's sheep shearing time here in the local neighborhood. I'm going to get my haircut, and I'll be back. Uh, might be a night out. Might not be. If there is, it'll be a brief one, or there might be an update in New York, whatever the case is. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you for the Super Chats, folks, who gave the Super Chats. I do appreciate that, Mr. B and others. And uh, hopefully, um, you all enjoyed this program uh, don't forget the like button we haven't hit 100 we're only at 86 it's easy it's right below the button there that was easy right below the screen push that button all right folks ruth um yeah try to uh, set up a subscription again if you don't mind ruth unless unless you're in a bind financially if you, if you if you can't do it financially please don't do it but if you want to be a member again try it and see if you get your your icons back hopefully you do i still uh pay for uh ronaldo's even though my my account's been closed for a year <laughs> so yeah i just don't have an icon that's why i'm a uh, spin around there among other reasons Thanks, everybody.
Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you here next time uh, for Answer the Question. Cheers, everybody.